I'm gonna let folks in. All right, thank you. Let's see, people are still connecting here. Hello, welcome everyone. And wait just a few seconds, we got a few more people coming in, I think. Thank y'all so much for joining us today um, on this very warm day. I think it's gonna cool off a little bit this weekend, maybe. <laughs> um, I'm Vanessa with the Dallas Public Library and I just have a few housekeeping rules. Um, so you will be muted and uh, have your cameras turned off for the, uh, at least the beginning part of the presentation that may change at the end <laughs> for questions. Um, but in the meantime, if during the presentation you have any questions, you can drop those in the chat and we'll get to those. Um, so we do this program in partnership with the Department of Environmental Quality and Sustainability. Vanessa, I'm sorry. I think you accidentally muted you. Sorry, I don't know where I stopped at. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so we do this program in partnership with the Department of Environmental Quality and Sustainability. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Bly so she can introduce um, what they do and also introduce our presenter for the day. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Vanessa. And that is correct. We are the Offices of Environmental Quality and Sustainability, which took me about eight months to say that quickly. It is no easy task. And then we also have some wonderful, amazing friends from Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. So before I can turn it to them, I'll just go ahead and get my intro rolling so we can start today. But if my screen looks good, we're going to go ahead and do it. So again, Dallas Environmental Quality and Sustainability Department, we are the offices of, so that means we're the city of Dallas. And we do outreach and education. And what we like to say is all of these topics are from A to Z. So today, we're kind of looking at the letter B for biology, but what we like to say for our department is we look at things like air quality, we look at our comprehensive environmental action plan, we look at zero waste, water conservation, and a lot of stormwater management. So if you've been here on Earth Day every day, you might have heard about six or seven of different uh, topics of these, but something that I do want to include is that we do have our WaterWise landscape tour coming up, and that is going to be in October. And if you are curious, you can go to Save Dallas Water now, and you can learn a little bit more about that. And it's, I believe, going to be our 27th year for 2021. But as I said before, um, I am in outreach and education on this nice blue square. And if you are in the city of Dallas and you care about environmental quality, you care about sustainability, these are all the different offices of which serve that. So if you like the environment, if you're in the right place. And within our outreach and education, we do talk about that green box right there again, storm water management. And it is my part today to tell you to take care of our storm water because storm water is our water. So whatever is sitting on top of the grass right before a rainstorm that soaks into the ground, whether that be pet waste, litter, cigarette butts, please never litter. Always pick up after your pets and just take a moment to think about our storm water. So some nice helpful reminders with that nice kiddo to help us through. And if you're taking care of the air, you're taking care of the water because of the water cycle, which is so awesome to remember, right? So thank you, uh, class education for helping us remember that one. So walk, bike, and carpool when possible. But I'm so very excited to introduce our special guest today. So let me just start off with introducing my friend Sam here. Sam Kieschnick is an urban wildlife biologist with Texas Parks and Wildlife, and he served the east side of the W Metroplex, and he's previously worked on as a nature educator with the city of Mansfield and Oliver Nature Park, and as a naturalist at the Fort Worth Nature Center and Refuge, so he's really had a hand in this, um, and as a science interpreter at the Fort Worth Museum of Science and History, as a botanist with BRIT, and as an instructor with Weatherford College, so I think he knows what he's going to be talking about today. He also has a master's degree from Tarleton State University studying the genetics of pocket gophers. As an urban wildlife biologist, Sam's focus will be on the three A's, awareness, appreciation, and action. And I will promise you there will be action items at the end of this, whether that's learning more, studying into a new word, or going outside and spending some time with nature. Sam, so good to see you. Great to see you too, Blythe. I hope that, can you hear me all right? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to come and talk uh, to you and everybody else about something that we get to do all the time is study are the urban critters that live with us and amongst us. 
Um, with me, I have Karen. Uh, Karen is an intern. Uh, she is an urban wildlife biologist intern this summer, did some really interesting studies. Would you mind talking just briefly about some of the things that you've done? Sure. So I had some great opportunities this summer to learn a lot about the wildlife that's uh, all around us. With Sam, we did a lot of um, surveys in South Dallas in parks that usually don't get a lot of attention and just doing surveys about what types of wildlife we can find there. Insects, mammals, birds, plants. And we found hundreds of species in, in parks that are sort of kind of forgotten about. So that was really awesome. And then with the other urban wildlife biologist, Rachel Richter, um, we did a trail cam study, um, a long transect that goes from uh, urban areas to rural areas and to see how different things affect wildlife. And we had 25 cameras and we found some awesome wildlife um, in some really uh, urban areas. Rachel found a ringtail cat and a spotted skunk, which is pretty, pretty special. So I uh, have learned a lot. Cool. Yeah. So we get to study um, all of the different critters that live with us in the urban ecosystem. And there's a word that Blythe taught us. And we all want to learn this word together. I like words. It's fun to be a, a, a word discoverer. And this is a word that we discovered with Blythe. Thank you so much for this discovery. The word is synanthrop or synanthropy. And you spell it S-Y-N-A-N-T-H-R-O-P-Y, or it can have an E there if you're talking about the critter. And Blythe, what does that word mean, if, if, you, if you wouldn't mind? So what I understand is this word and synanthropic animals or synanthropes, if you want to kind of refer to them as a whole, are animals that live beside us in urban areas. And Sam, what are a couple examples of those? Great. Yeah, exactly. And we're going to be talking all about the different uh, critters that live with us and amongst us. Some of them you may be familiar with, like raccoons and possums, but there are some other weird ones, some of the, the ones that Karen and I have been finding and documenting this, um, this summer that you might not be too familiar with. So I'm going to share my presentation real quick. Hopefully everyone can see that. All right. Can you see that? Okay. Life. All right, good. So we're going to talk about these synanthropes, and I still need to work on the word synanthropes or critters that are synanthropic, that live with us and amongst us in the city. But we'll start out with a general question. Is this a misnomer? Is this sort of a, a, an oxymoron? Can there be urban wildlife? You know, if, if you think of the critters uh, like giraffes and um, orangutans or lions and tigers. You, know, you may think of the zoo or you may think of where they are found naturally out in the rainforest or out in the savanna or in the our own backyards here in Dallas, Fort Worth. Now we have to change our perspective a little bit uh, but we can still see quite a bit of diversity that's found here in Dallas, Fort Worth. So what kind of nature is left? Uh, Vanessa Blythe and I, we were talking earlier about our favorite plants. Does anybody know the name of this plant? And you don't have to unmute yourself or put it in the chat. Just yell it out the window uh, if you would. What is it? Blue bonnets. Exactly right. These are our Texas blue bonnets. And they're here, yes, they're here, still living with us and amongst us in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex, but a lot more than just blue bonnets. We have the pollinators of blue bonnets. We have the things that eat blue, blue bonnet, the leaves of blue bonnets. We have the critters that eat the things that eat the blue bonnets. So all of this ecosystem still exists here in Dallas-Fort Worth. And so far, we've documented nearly or over 10,000 species just within Dallas, Fort Worth. So Blythe, how many can you name? Okay. All right. We've got the Cardinal. We've got the Mallard. Okay. We can see those 10, 15. Well, we still have about 10,130 something to go. So there is a lot of diversity that exists here in Dallas, Fort Worth. 
One of the things that Karen and I have gotten to do some this summer is mothing. We've got to go out and moth. And it is so much fun. Where we go, we put out a black light or we put out a UV light and we wait for things to come to the light. And it's great, great fun. Um, I got into this a couple of years ago when I was living in Fort Worth. They're on an apartment on 7th Street. So in kind of downtown Fort Worth, I would put up my black light. And this is an example of some of the critters that I saw in the evenings when I would have my black light out. What I, one that I would like to point your attention to is up there on the top row, the middle one. Okay, so you can see that's my human finger. So it's not a very big critter, but when I blow up the face, you can see the intricacy of this little critter. And this was found in downtown Fort Worth off 7th Street, an apartment complex on the balcony of an apartment complex in Fort Worth. A really, really weird, weird critter. It doesn't have a common name. The scientific name for it is Apache. Apache digeri, and perhaps for the Native American tribe, has kind of the war paint along the face of this one, but a really cool little plant hopper. And we've documented over a thousand different moths in Dallas Fort Worth alone. So, yes, there is definitely diversity here in DFW. How many grasshoppers can you name, Blythe? How many grasshoppers can you name? Let's see. Well, I like to say there's a green one and there's a brown one and there's a brown one with some green on it. Well, the reality is there's a lot more than those three different types of groups of grasshoppers just by their colors. So far, we've and Karen and I have gotten to document quite a few grasshoppers at the different parks that we've gone to. We've documented over a hundred species of grasshoppers just in Dallas, Fort Worth. One kind of interesting one that I'd like to tell you about is this guy. This one doesn't have much of eyes. It's, it can't really see too well. It lives mostly underground. But this one is Myrmecophilus. So with that word that, um, that Blythe taught us earlier, synanthropy or synanthrope, um, syn meaning with, and then anthropic, human beings, so with human beings. Well, this one has a Latin name that you can break up too. Mermico means ant, and Phyllis means loving. So this is an ant-loving cricket. What this little cricket does is it lives in ant nests, and it rolls around in the smells of ants, and then goes in, and then it eats their, their poop. It eats their feces. That's how this little cricket exists. And a cool thing, I found this one in a little urban area in Arlington or outside of Arlington. So this was at a ditch outside of a little store in Arlington. The point is we share Dallas-Fort Worth with a lot of critters, a lot of synanthropes, a lot of things that live with us and amongst us. So let's go through some of the common examples of the critters that live with us. Anybody know the name of these little critters? Well, yes, they're birds, but these are grackles. Our grackles do great living with us and amongst us. What does a grackle eat? Well, they eat Cheetos, Fritos, Doritos, Tostitos. They eat these things that we sometimes throw outside of our windows in a parking lot. They do great in of uh, uh, grocery store parking lots, basically. They get all of that food that we toss out and they live on either the food or the bugs that come to those foods. You might see some of these in these huge um, rookeries or these areas where they go in the evening to rest. And they will do that a lot of times in these parking lots because of food avail availability and also the lack of some of the, the major predators like hawks for them. So you'll see tons and tons of these grackles in, in some areas. What about this one? You know what kind of critter this is? Good, very good. I heard some people yelling snake. Yes, this is absolutely a snake. And this one is called a rat snake. And anytime we get phone calls about a snake in the house, 
it's almost always a rat snake. And rat snakes are interesting. They are, can be bio indicators. They tell us that not only do you have a rat in, or not only do we have a snake in the house, but you probably have a mouse too. So these snakes come inside indoors. They can live in barns and sheds and in garages. And they're usually going for the other critters that you'll see in these places, like our mice, like our rats. Uh, mice and rats are probably the best example of synanthropy because wherever we go, they come along with us. And these rats and mice can be great food for other critters too. So not only do we have the rats that live in our house and around our house, but we can have some of these that live in the trees. These are our squirrels, technically our fox squirrels. These guys do so well in Dallas-Fort Worth. They do so well in the urban area. And the truth is, most of Dallas-Fort Worth was on a prairie, on the Blackland Prairie. Yes, you'll have some of the post oak areas towards the west and the east too, but a lot of our area was prairie, so there weren't a ton of trees. But we love trees. So wherever we go, we bring trees with us. We were talking earlier about a tree that's a mix of a catalpa tree and a desert willow. Well, neither one of those are really too common here in Dallas-Fort Worth, but we have brought them into our areas, into our parks, in our houses, in our backyards, and our front yards. And because we bring these trees where we are, the squirrels utilize the fruits and the berries and the, the nuts of those trees. So they do quite well with us and amongst us. Uh, one critter that we also have some show and tell. Um, Karen, would you mind getting the raccoon uh, skin for us? And Blythe was mentioning that on this Zoom call uh, that they installed a, a touchscreen ability. So bring that uh, up right in the, by the screen. And if you want, go ahead and touch your screen. Do you feel it? Yeah, it's soft, isn't it? Very, very, very soft. So our raccoons do quite well here in Dallas, Fort Worth. Some interesting characteristics of our, our raccoons. And I don't know if you've ever gone out camping before and they've gotten into your containers in the margins. Well, that's because they're really good with their fingers. Raccoons are able to pry open bivalves with their little fingers. So they can pry open clams, the freshwater mussels. So your Tupperware lid for a raccoon is no problem. And they're also omnivores. So Karen, if you could show off the, the, the skull of these. So their front teeth are pretty sharp there. So they are definitely meat eaters. But when we open it up, you can see the, um, the molars back there where they use these to chomp down and chew on some of the fruits and vegetables that we too as omnivores enjoy. there too. So we have raccoons do quite well in the urban ecosystem. Definitely are synanthrop the synanthropes. I love that Blythe. I'm going to use that at least 15 times during this presentation alone. Um, okay, how about this one? Are you familiar with this critter? This is a possum. Again, bring that uh, right up to the screen. And again, you might be able, if it's a touch screen, it depends if you updated your Zoom software, if you can uh, feel that or not. But are possums another critter that does great with us and amongst us? And some people, when they look at a possum face, they go, ooh, that's kind of a gross looking critter. I think they're kind of cute and charming. I think they're kind of cute and charming. They're actually really, really beneficial to us in Dallas, Fort Worth. They are omnivores, so they will eat whatever is available. But there's also some interesting other things that they eat. Opossums have a relatively low body temperature for mammals. So they're not as impacted by uh, venomous snakes. They're not as impacted by rabies. They're not as impacted by Lyme disease. So they can eat our venomous snakes like copperheads, cottonmouths, and rattlesnakes. They also eat ticks. 
believe it or not, uh, there's an interesting correlation or an adverse correlation to the amount of Lyme disease in an area. If that's down, it means that you likely have less ticks and more opossums eating the ticks. So they're definitely beneficial critters uh, for us in, in Dallas, Fort Worth and throughout the country. But I think, I think Blythe, don't you agree? That's kind of a cute little charming face too. Yeah, I think they're cute and charming. Um, how about this one? You know this little critter? Well, probably so. This one is a skunk. So you can see that skunk skin there. And very interesting with the, the fur of this, it's actually delivering a message. It's delivering a message with the colors of its hair. The message is don't get close. You don't want to get close with that, uh, the, the different, the black and the white, those strongly polar opposite colors says don't get near. It's going to be a mistake. Skunks, they are also omnivores. So here's the skull of our little skunk. We'll bring it right up to the screen there. So there's the skunk uh, skull. They're omnivores, so they have both the, the molars and the canines and incisors and all that sort of stuff to break down a mix of different things that they eat. But you probably know skunks for their defense. And I don't know who took this picture, but way to go, whoever took this picture. They actually have a little structure that acts like a turret and it moves around right there under the tail. And they use that to move around. And I know that the cartoons sometimes make it look like it's a cloud of smoke that comes out. Well, not with skunks in reality. It's more like a can of mace that they'll use as they aim it to their potential predator. So it's a really interesting thing when we get the, the tail and show that off. Oops. When we get the tail and show that off, it sort of lifts up that tail and that little tiny turret structure aims that can of mace. Another weird thing about skunks is yes, that defense works for most of their predators, but there's a, another predator that eats and predates upon skunks that doesn't have a great sense of smell. Does anybody know the name of that critter that eats a skunk? Hmm, and you can write it in the chat if you know. Let me give you some hints. So this critter doesn't have much of a, scent, uh, of a sense of smell. It's also active at night. Hmm, so it's nocturnal, generally nocturnal. And another one that maybe gives it away, it flies around at night. Hmm. And Blythe, would you read any of the chats? Did any of the, the folks on chat mention anything? The folks on chat are helping me out here. I have two guesses for an owl. I did not think of that. Way to go. And that is exactly right. Owls are predators of skunks. They don't have a great sense of smell. So the skunk's defense of this stinky spray aren't effective to owls, in particular, the great horned owls. And if you ever go to a museum and smell ant or ant, smell owl, great horned owl, the, the skins of those, they typically have a, a skunk smell to them too, because that's one of their uh, main prey items. So way to go, uh, people on the chat that said owls. That's exactly right. Okay, here's another one too. And this one has got a beautiful pelt. Uh, and it's one that we have an example of too. So this one is a bobcat. And if you would, Karen, show off that little tail of the bobcat. Yeah, this is how they get their name. So it's Bob. It's a little bob of a cat. They have that little bob-like tail. And these guys, if you would, if, you're, if you have access to the chat, have you seen a bobcat in real life before? Write in the chat, yes or no, not yet if you've seen a bobcat in real life before. So bobcats, yes, they are um, synanthropic. They live with us and amongst us here in Dallas-Fort Worth. If you look at the skull of a bobcat, so there's our lovely skull of a bobcat. 
they can be somewhat um, omnivores, but mostly they are carnivores. And another cool thing that Karen and I do as biologists is we can actually study a skull and it gives us ideas of what that critter eats. So this one, when we look at the molars, so Karen, if you'll bring the molars right up to the screen there, good, that's all right. <laughs> so if you look at the molars of them, they're all very, very sharp. And these are used for cutting the, the prey. They don't have the flat molars like we have in the back of our mouths. So these guys, yes, are mostly carnivores, but they will eat things like bugs and worms and crickets too. But mostly they're eating uh, the little mice and the rats and small little critters as well. We at Texas Parks and Wildlife, actually before I came, we did a really interesting study on the home ranges of bobcats and how they use little creeks and corridors to move through the ecosystem. Well, one of the bobcats that um, my predecessors were documenting and monitoring was hit by a car, oh, man, and it became roadkill. So it's kind of a bummer. We go, oh no, the loss of data, but they also utilize that individual to do a necropsy or they cut open its stomach to look what it had eaten. And inside of the stomach of a bobcat were at least a dozen rats. So there were a dozen rats inside the belly of a recent roadkill bobcat. So this tells us that they're providing us a tremendous service by eating a lot of the rats that may annoy us. So they're definitely here within the urban ecosystem and providing a good service to us too. How about this one? Anybody know this one? Have you ever seen one of these in real life? Go ahead and write it in the chat if you've seen one of these in real life. Um, Karen, would you make the sound of one of these? <laughs> Arr! Good, yeah, awesome. Oh, good, I put her on the spot on that. Arr! Yeah, so these, they're, they're Canis latrans is the name of our coyote, the scientific name. And latrans actually means singing or barking. So this is a singing dog. And they have a whole repertoire of different barks and yelps and a great little uh, song that Karen uh, did just then of our coyotes. So let's take a look at the pelt of these or at the skin of it. Again, if you want to touch your screen, maybe you can pick up if you have the, the new Windows software um, to, to pick up the, the feel of it. But trust me, it's very, uh, mm, it's so soft. Oh, it's so soft. Uh, what we do around the office, sometimes if it's cold, we just put these pelts all, <laughs> all over our bodies and it's, it's cool. We feel like Vikings. But um, these guys do so well in the urban ecosystem. Let's take a look at the, the skull of these. So one thing that's also interesting about these, yes, they are omnivores. So they'll be eating fruits and vegetables, but they also tiny rats, the little tiny mammals, small mammals. They'll eat our bunny rabbits and they'll eat our squirrels as well. Have you heard that dogs can smell really well? I mean, yes, they smell great after a bath, but they also have the ability to smell really, really well. And I don't know if you can see in there, and it's kind of hard to see in there. It's really dark. Sorry about yeah. that. But there is a nasal bone that they have, and it's kind of like a spongy structure in there. And there's a lot of surface area for cells that study or that pick up senses or the chemoreceptors. So they're able to smell really well. Oh yeah, Karen, let's see if we can blast some light in there. Yeah, there you go. So can you see inside? Yes, good. So there's that kind of spongy looking uh, structure in there that's the nasal bone. And coyotes, like all dogs, have this structure to help them smell. They can pick up the sense of potential prey, but also each other. They can see if, if there's another um, pack of coyotes or if there's another individual not too far off, they can pick up the smells of those. So they do excellent in our urban area. 
And hopefully some folks on the chat, if you've seen one before, you'll write a yes, I've seen one on there. You find these guys in Dallas, Fort Worth, and they do quite well. Here's another one. So what I've talked about mostly are native species, except the rats. Um, we do have native rats, but the house mouse and the roof rat, those are non-natives. Here's another one of our non-native critters. Um, and Karen, would you make the sound of one of these? Good, <laughs> perfect, uh, perfect. Uh, yes, so they do that. <laughs> the series of grunts there to communicate, but they probably do that as they're you know, digging into the ground, getting some of the little roots and uh, worms and stuff like that. These guys do great in the urban ecosystem, kind of unfortunately, because they can be a nuisance species. And in Dallas County alone, uh, I don't remember the exact numbers, but a couple years ago, they trapped over a thousand pigs just within Dallas County, specifically the southern part of Dallas County. They are omnivores and they are opportunist, so they will eat pretty much anything and everything. And there we can see on the skin, on the skull, the molars in the back that Karen's showing off right there. So they have those flat molars that they use to grind the fruits and vegetables. But they also have those big canines there, the tusks that they can use to pierce their prey, to break open and, and sort of cut that prey too. So they are our omnivores and they're actually quite smart and do quite well here with us and amongst us. So all of these critters are found in Dallas, Fort Worth. We have all of these in Dallas, Fort Worth. One of the things that I like to do, and Blythe, I'm so glad that you mentioned action items, because this is one of the things, and Karen and I got to play with this a lot this summer, is documenting the different critters that we found in Dallas-Fort Worth. And you too can do this yourself. As you see an interesting critter outside, you can take a picture of it, and you can upload that to this uh, network, this community called iNaturalist. And if you want to, you can see some of the parks that Karen and I went to and the different critters that we documented in the parks in the South Dallas County at a few different parks in South Dallas County. We put all of our observations on iNaturalist so that other people can see what's out there too. So it's not just a picture of something like this lovely butterfly, this common buckeye, but it's also a little bit of data. It says where this organism, this critter, this plant, this bug, this bird, whatever it might be, where it is in space and in time. So it gives us this data to compare to what we see or don't see next year or 10 years down the line or 100 years down the line, even past our lifetimes. We can use this to compare. So we do this all the time in Dallas-Fort Worth. I was using this with some, um, some students at Texas Christian University, TCU, and we were documenting the critters that we found around campus. And we found some of these, these little lizards called anoles. There were a few that were found in, um, around the campus of TCU. And it may not seem like it's that important or it's that interesting just by itself, but when we combine it with thousands of other observations, like this, as we step, uh, as we take a step back, as we take another step back, and as we take another step back, each one of those little dots, each one of these data points adds to our global knowledge of where things are in space and in time. So with our annals, this green annal, you can see they're mostly found in the southeast part of the United States, but it looks like some annals went on a great vacation to Hawaii and to San Francisco or San, uh, San Diego and Los Angeles. Well, they probably went on the backs of us, either in our uh, aquarium containers or in through their eggs, through plants, whatever it might be. They went with us to these places and now they're new for those different areas. So this gives us a, a great way to monitor different species too. So if you have um, an, a, a phone, there is an app for that. And I'm not going to go too much into the weeds of how to use it. Uh, it's kind of like trying to do a presentation on how to play baseball. 
Yes, I can show you what a baseball looks like. I can show you what a bat looks like. But the best way to learn to play baseball is to go out and hit the ball around and throw it around. The same thing with iNaturalist is just to go out and play with it. A really, really neat thing with iNaturalist too. And I know I saw a few familiar faces or a few familiar names uh, on the attendance here. So you probably heard me talk nonstop about iNaturalist. I'm just bonkers about it. But there is a, a new visual algorithm that you take a picture of something and it gives you suggestions of what it might be. So it gives kind of that um, artificial intelligence of what it might be in name. There's a website too. This is where you can go and look to see the different observations that Karen and I uh, put up this summer on iNaturalist, where you can go, you can search for different things. What are the different dragonflies of an area or what are the different um, skunks? Where have they been found in Dallas, Fort Worth? You can get some ideas from the website. Um, if you're not old enough, if you're not over the age of 13, but you still want to play, absolutely please keep playing come play with us there's another app called seek and this is where you can get you can download it on your phones and with your parents permission perhaps or on your parents phone or your, your guardians or whoever grandma grandpa's big brother's big sister and um you get this app and it gives you different challenges like can you find five plants today so you go out to a park and try to find five different types of plants, or can you find 10 pollinators? And it, you get these cool little badges and little tokens, um, at least on the, on the app, if you complete the challenges. Another action item too, that if you have a backyard or a favorite park that you go to, is putting in some of these plants, putting in some of the wildflowers, putting in some of the different plant species out there. That brings a lot of different bugs and the different bugs brings different birds and the different birds brings all sorts of different things in your own area. So you can actually create a refuge in your own area um, to help all the little urban critters, the synanthropes, the things that live with us and amongst us in DFW. And as a scientist, let's all, let me also say that if you have biodiversity, that means that you have a healthy ecosystem or healthy ecosystems have biodiversity. And it provides us with so many different ecosystem services, clean air, clean water, all of these sort of things, biodiversity or the different types of plants and critters and all that sort of stuff that exist. That's good. That means that you have a healthy ecosystem. I think it's cool that we share the planet and that we share Dallas Fort Worth with so many cool natural neighbors. I talked about just a few of them. Karen and I showed you a few of the different critters, some mostly mammals that we have here in Dallas Fort Worth, but there are so, 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 so many natural neighbors that we have. And I think it's a cool thing to learn the names of some of these different things. So I encourage you to go out and learn some of the names of the different critters that we have here in Dallas Fort Worth. With that, I would love to open it up. I think we might have some time for any questions or comments. Just to let you know, if you're nervous to ask a question or a comment, you can send it to for a long email address, but there it is. Um, I'm also really active on iNaturalist. I'm Sam Biology on iNaturalist, so you can uh, find me there and ask me a question or a comment there too. So I think we might have some time for, for questions or comments, uh, Blythe. Yes, we do. We already do have a question here. And I think uh, just to repeat it, you can email Sam. You can even chat us privately if you don't feel like putting it in the whole chat, whatever feels comfortable. But um, Sam, with your knowledge too, and Karen's help, uh, if you have any questions, I'm sure they could answer them. We also have one here that I'd like to know, and is that that is, do all grasshoppers hop or do some kind of crawl, maybe like that ant cricket situation? That's a great question. Way to go, whoever asked that question. So in that group of Orthoptera, that's the, the, the insect order that, that contains the crickets and the grasshoppers and the katydids, one of the characteristics of all of those are the extended hind legs. So they have those larger hind legs. So as far as I know, they all kind of hop 
or have that ability to hop. However, there are some like the tree crickets that do have long hind legs, but they are mostly crawlers rather than hoppers. So they'll crawl around rather than hop um, as much. The, the little myrmecophilus that I showed you earlier, the ant loving cricket, that has the extended hind legs. And when I've seen one before, that one that I saw in that ditch, it did do kind of a little dinky hop. Not much of a hop, mm -hmm. but it still did a little tiny dinky um, hop. So it still had that ability. But as far as I know, all order, all insects in the order Orthoptera have that ability to hop, even though some may do more of a crawl, like our tree crickets. Great question from an entomologist there. I like it. Awesome. Awesome. Feel free to put your questions in the chat too. I've got some questions um, as I learn from this. Um, I think also it's what I'm taking away from this. And I just want to announce it because it's just so exciting is that animals have the capability to tell us what's going on in the environment, right? What's going on around there. And you said that was the uh, biosignificant signifier. Oh my goodness. Right. Bio indicator. Yeah. Bio indicator. Okay. And I just think that's really wonderful that, you know, the natural world can indicate to us what's going on. And then we again can do that back to the natural world by taking a picture, uploading that to iNaturalist. I also wanted to say, if you haven't done iNaturalist or you haven't done Seek for those that are watching, um, I have kind of played around with Seek because I like talking like this and reading storybooks and teaching kids. So I thought let's download uh, that app that is for younger users and it's colorful and you can win badges and it's like a big old a game um, and it's really fun to use. So if you don't have Seek 2 or you've never even looked at it, I would suggest even looking at that um, as well or even sharing that with your friends and family. And my question and out this kind of paragraph is, do owls, are, are owls stinkier than um, possums there? Because they naturally, they usually will get sprayed by skunks or owls a stinky animal maybe? That's a good question. And, you know, so I've smelled the dead owls before, um, you know, specimens of owls and they, the, especially the great horned owls, they will mm -hmm. usually have that skunk smell. But most of the other owls, like our screech owls and our barred owls, mm -hmm. I don't really think that they are that smelly. Um, birds do this kind of maintenance to themselves, too. They do a lot of this preening to spread some of the oils around those wings. So they'll do that a lot for um, to keep water out, basically. So they're adding more of these oils to it. So I think that prevents them from getting kind of that super strong smelliness of, of perhaps some other critters. Um, possums, do possums smell? They have the ability to smell, but I don't know if they, you know, if they smell um, that bad, even though you'll see them in um, garbage cans and things like that. A lot of our wild critters are pretty good at maintaining themselves. So they will be cleaning themselves much like your cat or your dog does, especially cats when they lick themselves. This is kind of an adaptation, not just to, you know, keep us from giving them a bath, but it's more of an adaptation to keep parasites and uh, other things off of their hair. So even though a skunk is super smelly thing, it will still be maintaining its hair. It still wants to have that sort of Vidal Sassoon kind of um, look with that lushness of hair to keep predators or to keep parasites off of it. So even though our, our great horned owls get sprayed by skunks and they might be a little smelly, most of our other animals won't really have that kind of mm, pungent smell. And I'm not trying to throw owls under the bus here. We all have our bad days, but um, I do see a comment here um, that says possums are cool. I believe that they're only the, the only marsupial in the U.S. And I really like that you kind of uh, touched on possums don't carry as much disease. And maybe for those that are listening, if you haven't really, there's kind of been these new developments that um, possums are pretty clean and pretty awesome animals and try not to knock the possum before you see it. And it kind of does that scary thing. Yeah, and, and something else that I'll also say, and we could do a good three hours just on <laughs> possums, but one of the things too that I, I love and I think that possums are so endearing 
anytime I see an adult opossum, the first thing that I do is I congratulate it. I congratulate it for getting to adulthood. Possums, like you said, would you mind getting the, the possum skin, Karen? Possums have a rough go from day one. So as you said, Blythe, they are marsupials, which means they have a marsupium, which is the pouch. And inside of that pouch, and this is not a good example because it's just the skin of it, but they'll have a little pouch here. And inside that pouch, there are these points of attachment that release milk. Okay, so it's a mammal, so it's still a, a milk producing critter. And it has these weird little points and there's typically around 13 of them, 12 in a circle and one right in the middle. And as the babies are being birthed, they're just basically lima bean sized things. And they're blind, they can't see, but they do have pretty good arm muscles. Their first task after they are birthed is to crawl out into the pouch, into one of those points of attachment, one of the 13 points of attachment. The kind of harsh reality and the kind of sad thing is she typically gives birth to about 20 babies at a time. So from day one, the first task is to crawl up and to get to one of those points of attachment before your other brothers and sisters do. So that's a pretty rough life from the get-go. So when you see a possum, an adult opossum, congratulate it, appreciate it. Not only is it doing a great service, but it's had a pretty rough life from day one. So uh, they are definitely creatures in my mind of appreciation. And there's a question here in the chat. Um, has the COVID pandemic affected the ecology in Dallas at all? That's a great, great question. So, and we have gotten this question a little bit too, as the, as the kind of society shut down and we were all stuck inside and we weren't driving around, perhaps that reduced the amount of roadkill, perhaps. Um, but I'm not sure if it really impacted wildlife as much as we maybe idealistically think it might have. They have been doing just fine with or without us too. So a lot of our native critters existed well before we came into the new world uh, or any of that sort of stuff. So before Dallas-Fort Worth was Dallas-Fort Worth, there were coyotes, there were skunks, there were possums, there were raccoons, things like that. So they were able to persist without us. Now, some of them being synanthropic, uh, do well along with us. So because we're still throwing out garbage, they are still feeding on some of that garbage or the things that come to that garbage. But I don't really think that there was much of an impact on our society shutdown to wildlife. One of the positive things that I experienced is I got a lot more calls from people that said, I saw a bobcat today. I didn't know that they were here. So because we were stuck at home and didn't spend all of our time out and about at work or at school or at church or wherever, we were noticing more of the wildlife around us. So I think that is one of the positive things that maybe not wildlife changed that much, but maybe our perspectives changed a little bit more that we recognized and saw that there was wildlife here. And um, there is, I guess, a plug for pollinators here too, because I guess maybe that could be the conversation of people that were staying home a lot and maybe working on their garden and creating wildflowers and shade and water, which is what pollinators love. So um, maybe if there was maybe a slight influx in gardens or something like that, protecting pollinators, but that is um, not a scholarly guess by any sorts for me. <laughs> Very cool. Would be awesome. I support that. I love it when people change some of their landscaping to include some more of the native plants and bring in some more of those pollinators. That's a good thing. And I wanted to ask about po the possibility or just more about um, a, what Karen saw, which was a spotted skunk. And then we have in the chat too, Karen, if you have an iNaturalist, there's uh, folks also inquiring about yours as well. Um, so if you want to put that, I can put that in the chat. Um, and I would love to know more about the spotted skunk and how rare that is in DFW. Yeah. So do you want to talk about the spotted skunk, the location of it? Like, where was it? Yeah. 
Um, so the spotted skunk was at uh, Heritage Park, which is in downtown Fort Worth. So it's a uh, right along sort of a running trail underneath the bridge. It's by one of the TCC campuses. So it's pretty well frequented. Um, so to see a spotted skunk there, they think that it was a male who was kind of just moving through. Um, they will move long distances in search of a mate. So that's what they, that's why they think it was there. So. Yeah. And it's particularly interesting, the spotted skunk too, because that's a species that we call a species of conservation concern. So there has been a dramatic decrease of spotted skunks throughout their range. They're found, I think, pretty much throughout Texas historically, but for whatever reason, there has been a dramatic decrease of spotted, spotted skunks. So to document these things still in, in DFW, still along the Trinity River in downtown Fort Worth was a really, really exciting celebratory thing that, that Karen got to experience in this uh, camera trap study. So, so yeah, so that's um, one of the kind of neat things with that camera trap study. The other thing, so Karen's iNaturalist account, um, K. Reiki. So it's K. Reiki, um, which is yeah. K for Karen. And I'll, maybe we could put it in the chat. Yeah, we'll, we'll throw that in the chat real yeah. quick. And there's a question here. Um, are there porcupines in the DFW area? The Dallas Zoo featured one of their porcupine friends the other week on Earth Day Every Day. Yeah, so... Historically, that's another thing that historically we probably had porcupines around here, but pretty much the best place to see them is a little further west and a bit further north in the panhandle. They're quite abundant in the panhandle and then further west too. Um, I was just uh, this past weekend, I went on an insect survey trip to Colorado City, which is west of Sweetwater. So it's kind of west of Abilene, west of Sweetwater. And I saw, saw a roadkill porcupine around mm. Abilene area. So you can still see them a little bit further west. I'm not sure if they're really that common uh, here in Dallas, Fort Worth. There was one not too, too long ago that was documented in Arlington, though. So there you still can occasionally find them here in Dallas, Fort Worth, but really they're a bit more common uh, west and north of us. Very cool. Okay, so I'm observing the chat. Any other questions on the chat, feel free. Um, I have maybe a question that kind of compels in this, we'll see. But um, the other day, my friend was driving her car, as one does, and she saw crossing a road, not a chicken, but an iguana. Um, she saw that iguana get hit by the car. She grabbed it by a towel. She saved some uh, animals before, so she's had some light experience. But then she kind of went on the pursuit because this iguana was um, not native here to call an animal rescue that could maybe, maybe check this animal better out. So if I were to see an iguana or a kimono dragon or the world's rarest lizard on the side of the road, what kind of animal rescues would you suggest being what you do? Is there just for the public, what would you suggest? So great question, Bly. Thank you for asking that. So uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife actually give out permits to um, rehabbers. So there are different rehabbers by county and also by um, uh, taxon or by type of critter. So with some, there are like possum rehabbers or there are squirrel rehabbers. And Texas Parks and Wildlife, we give those rehabbing permits and there's a different sort of um, protocol that those rehabbers need to do for those permits. But yes, absolutely. If you search for rehabbers by county on the Texas Parks and Wildlife page, it gives you the list and it also gives you um, kind of the people to reach out to and the different type. Now, if you see something like an iguana or a Komodo dragon, you know, here in Dallas, Fort Worth, it's probably a release pet or it's some critter that escaped out, out of a captivity. And in those cases, what, what we like to do, well, I mean, something that I talked about, I will document it on iNaturalist. I'll document these things. And with some of those released uh, pets, those can become issues. Those can be our next invasive species. So even though it was, it was cool when you had it and you named it Sparky, you know, on a guana named Sparky, but if it goes out and it lays eggs or if it goes out and meets with other um, 
sparkies, other iguanas that were that escaped from captivity, then you can have a problem with with those. So that's how some of our invasive species come about is people releasing their pets that they get bored with or, or stuff like that. So if I see a weird critter like that, definitely document it on iNaturalist. Um, as a matter of fact, there have been some weird critters that have been documented outside of exotic ranches in Southwest Texas. A warthog was found as roadkill. So one of the exotic ranches had a warthog that got out of the cage, out of the, the fences, and it ended up in ro as roadkill. So who knows? I mean, I don't really particularly want warthogs to be the new things that we're battling with, like we're battling with pigs. But that's one of the things that can happen is they find a hole in the fence or they get released by a, a previous owner. And that's that's not the best thing for them. So the rehabbers, those are the ones to, to reach out to if you see uh, the animal that is injured or, or things like that. Does that make sense, Blythe? Yes, absolutely. And the iguana is in a rehabber's home now, and I was told is unusually healthy. So we're good for the iguana. All no right, bad way to go. No bad story. Way to go. Uh, but Sam, I just want to both of you and close out kind of towards the program. Um, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for this information. Um, uh, we have some resources in the chat and then your email as well. And I'll stress to our audience again, Sam knows it. If you've got a question about it, Sam has probably even taken a picture of it. So from micro moths to wild warthogs, Sam knows what he's talking about. And if you ever have any questions, I will probably send you his way. So go ahead and, and skip me and go that way. Yeah. And real quick, Blythe, what was the word of the day? Synanthropic. And I can yes. put that in the chat. Good. Perfect. There we go. We had one. You already beat me to it. That's great, Sam. Thank you. Thank you both so much for your time. Thank you, Dallas Public Library as well for those resources in the chat and doing this. And thank you so much for attending Earth Day every day. I believe our next session will be um, in September, uh, the first week of September over thrifting. And we're going to kind of talk about a different level, a letter in the alphabet, which we'll be talking about clothing consumption and things like that. So thank you so much. I always enjoy the programming, Sam, as always. It's a wonderful connection. And thank you all for attending as well. Okay. Bye, guys.